through 16. And I'm excited because this, this, this verse of 6 through 16 is really Paul, and like I said, we, we know that the, 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 the whole book of 2 Timothy is Paul's last words because he is about to be killed in this experience. But what makes this even more exciting for me is because we're close to the end of the letter and now you start to hear Paul speak about how he has lived his life, how he has been faithful in the service of the Lord. I love this because see, some of us want to be a couple of weeks into the situation and come out, well, you know, I've finished my course, I've finished my record. No. He doesn't say any of this. Multiple years go from that road to the master's experience to where he is now. Multiple years have passed by and he's evangelized. He's done three missionary trips, all these wonderful things. And now you come into this point where you hear him start to speak about what the end looks like. And he says that I finished uh, the race. It speaks of being complete. But it means, it speaks of great reason, it speaks of being complete, but continuing. It completes here, but it continues on when he graduates. All of that. So let's jump into verse 6 real quick. Where it says, I'm going to ask you the question, where did I write it at? Oh, here we go. Give me my packet. Alright, verse 6. What did Paul know was drawing near? His death. death. His death. He knew his time of departure was coming. And when he speaks of departure, you notice he didn't say he was going to die. He said he was going to depart. See, cause he, do you know the reason why he could say that is because for a believer, believer, for a believer, death doesn't become the enemy any longer. You know why? Does anybody know why death only becomes the enemy for us? Because we're not, well, I think for one thing, because we're not, uh, 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 we're just here for a short period of time, uh-huh. and our hope is in heaven. There you go, you have it. What, what's the word I'm looking for, though? Um, it's like a, a funeral and a homegoing celebration. There's a difference. Yeah. A funeral, somebody dies. Mm-hmm. Right. Homegoing celebration, somebody went to heaven. Right. You see what I'm saying? There's a huge difference. I think it's citizenship. Our citizenship, Our citizenship yeah. is in heaven. That's right. But so, because see, he's the one, the one who wrote that says, "Absent from the body is to be where." Present right. with the Lord. So therefore, he sees that the, he's saying, "I'm departing." He got his bag packed. He got his ticket. He's on board. He's waiting to get on board to go home. That's what I love about this because he doesn't see death as the finality. It's not the end. He's not saying, well, who the Lord, what's that thing next, the next step. He knows what the next step is. That's what I love about this is that he knows, he's confident in what the next step is. So therefore, when he says that, I'm a, that he knew his death was coming, he says, <coughs> he says uh, the time of his departure was there. That's why he's going on a trip, don't Come here. Yes, go ahead. Oh, he's going up. There's, there's, there's an old song that used to come, going up, young. <laughs> yes, you got it. <laughs> Watch out. I'm going to get ready for that guy for me one day. <laughs> Verse 7. What three phrases does Paul use to describe his life as a Christian? This fight. Stop right there. He said, I fought the good fight. What does that sound like? He's a fighter. But he gave us three analogies to Timothy to be. A soldier. An athlete. An athlete. Let's see, now he's <laughs> But when he says he fought a good fight. Teacher's pet. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when he says he fought a good fight, this is what he talks about. He talks about being a soldier. A soldier is one who stands at his post. You know, even though the, the war is raging, he does not shriek back from the responsibility. He's saying, I have fought the good fight. I love that. That means that he's completed the fight, but yet it's continuing. Mm-hmm. The next one was that he finished the race. Now he sounds like a what when he says that? Yeah. An athlete. Because now athletes have to be prepared. They have to be physically fit to run this race, but also they must run the race according to the rules that they plan to what? To finish and win. So this is how he's saying. This is how he's, because he's describing his Christian life. He's giving us these three phrases to describe his Christian life. From the road of Damascus up until this point in time, this is how he had done it. He has been, he's fought the good fight, now he's finished the race, but what's the last one? Now, why would he say that he's kept the faith? Why would that be important? Because he could have deviated. He could have changed it, he could have added to it, he could have taken away from it, but he meant that he 
guarded the truth. That's what he said. I've kept the faith. I've guarded it. Even because, again, he went into places where paganism was huge. Where any type of worshiping, philosophy, whatever you can think of, it was there. So he could have easily added to or jumped from to something else. But he says, but I have kept the faith. Now, he has been persecuted. Isn't that enough? Sure. He has been through a few things. See, you, you know, because I want you to realize something that it is his life is coming to an end. And gonna, we're going to read about a passage of scripture here where he's going to say when well, he had the chance to stand before Caesar and all the, the Roman crowd. You know, if somebody put enough pressure on you, man, to say, well, you know what, I won't kill you if you say you don't believe in Christ, you might consider it. Run that by me again. I said, if someone put enough pressure on you saying this right here, if you say you denounce that you believe in Christ, you do it or you're going to die. Right, okay. Because okay. see, here it was. Paul was in prison for what? What was he in prison for? Preaching the gospel. Preaching the gospel. And he was considered a great evil for that. Right. So now he's got to be, he knows his life is end is coming, so therefore he could have sold that in there. Because yeah. basically, he was the champion of this experience. Especially in the wrong area, right? So he could have sold out. He could have sold it. He could have saved flesh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But like we talked about before, he chose. He knew he was going to die if he went to Caesar, but he chose to go there. Cut. It was one who kept the faith. He kept the faith. Yeah. Uh, I'm seeing it. Yeah, I don't understand. So see, we're going we're gonna to cover a little past the scripture here because see, this was foretold of his life even before he ever got there. Well, it was, it was the Jesus thing, because Jesus uh, uh, offered himself up, too. You know, he uh, went to the cross willingly. He gave himself up. Didn't have to. Mm-hmm. So did. So did. Oh. Uh, just look over to Acts chapter 9, around the 15th verse or so, I believe it is. Timothy was Paul's carpet, his carbon copy. He was set 
to correct him. He told him to imitate him, but he said, but I'm sending Timothy to you. In <laughs> fact, I love that. He said, I want you to call some of the Corinthians. And the first friend, he says, I want you to imitate me. But then he said to them, but I'm sending you Timothy. That means that he was. Yeah. So, let's go ahead on here. Uh, verse 10. Who had forsaken Paul? And why? So, so what does the scripture speak about that? Love in the world? Is that James 4 4? Is that what I got? James no, 4 4. No, Colossians 4. I got James 4 4. So it's James 4 4. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry. James 4 4. Maybe we would live with that James 4 4 for you because see. That's the good stuff. We can't serve two masters. You can't serve God. No, you can't. James 4 4 says this. This is what James 4 4 says. It says, It says, Adulterers and adulteresses, do you know that the friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. So therefore, Demas, and here's what's hurt, it's got to hurt, because Demas was a, was a close person who traveled and worked in the ministry with Paul. And here's what happened when it got too thick. You ever hear when they get too hot in the kitchen, people, they said, I don't need it got too hot for him. And he said that he loved the world too much. He loved this world too much, so therefore he departed and went to Thessalonica. Is that what he went to, right? Yeah. And so this is something to realize is that don't be alarmed when those who have walked with you and you have prayed with them and they broke bread at your table and you held them up when they were struggling that when all of a sudden persecution comes and you look up and you need them and you can't find them, don't be discouraged by that. Because it's happened to greater people than us. And see, imagine this to be a Paul who then bled out on folks, poured all he had into you, and then when he needed you the very first time, yeah, I should. It's kind of like Jesus in the garden. It is. Yes. When he needs his disciples to stay away, to stay away from me, just one out. Right. Pray with me, just watch with me. But he said, he said, watch with me, just one out. Oh, that was tough. All right. Verse 11. Who alone was with Paul when he wrote this epistle? Luke. Luke. Who was Luke? His doctor. His physician. Anything else special about Luke? He's the only one that's tough about that. That's one special thing about him. But is there something else? He's a Gentile. He's a Gentile. That's another one. Anything else? Is there not a book with his name on it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Is he not right. one? <laughs> who, who, who came back then? There you go. I'm just trying to get you to see that, you know, he, he, was, he was around with Paul for many of the things that was going on. So therefore, he had a book with his name on that he authored, and then also Acts was written by him. <coughs> this is why he says we in that deal. He wasn't French. He was also after Christ. Yes. He didn't know. He didn't know Christ. No, so he's a journalist. He, like that's right. He he came along afterwards. This is what's so beautiful about it that there was someone that 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 was not an apostle in the experience, but yet got a book in here. Neither was Jude, uh, 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 excuse me, Jude or James. Those are Jesus' past brothers, so. Well, actually, Paul didn't either. No. And he's got, how many books he got? Uh, 12 or 13. 12 or 13. So. All right. Verse 12. Wait a minute. I got another 11 for you. Why did Paul want Timothy to get Mark and bring him with him? Mark was profitable That's right. He was useful for the ministry. He was useful for the ministry. Now you remember a little ways back, Mark failed. John Mark failed. This is what I love about this part. When we covered it last week, we got to see a person be restored, redeemed. Because you, 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 you ever heard of backsliding? Yeah. Okay. So this kind of thing what happened with, with, with little John Mark. He, he was not cool with the idea of taking the word of God 
to the Gentiles. So therefore, he just like, no, I ain't with this, I'm out of it. And so he walks away from the duty of doing so. And, and, and when it came back for the next missionary journey to come along, Barnabas says to Paul, let's grab John Mark and go on. And Paul said, nope, it ain't happening. It ain't happening. And see, this is what's unique about it, was because John Mark was Barnabas.
Do you see the comparison between him and Stephen when he was being stoned before he died? He said, Lord, do not hold us against them. That's some tough stuff, guys. That's a beautiful illustration of a life that totally committed and submitted to the Lord. Because somebody stepped on your feet today. Somehow forgiveness is not enough. You know. That's a natural reaction. It's, it's just not enough. But this is this is when you this is these are lives that are totally committed. And I love the illustrations here because this is the end of his life. He could have he could say and do anything he wants. At the end he thought he got carte blanche. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. But he's saying that it not be held against him. There's, there's a nugget. Put that one in your pocket. Thoughts, questions, comments on the review before we jump into 17? Anything? Nothing? Alright, 17, here we go. 17 reads. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that the message might be preached fully through me and that all the Gentiles might hear. Also, I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. Now, I'm going to go back to 16 real quick where he says this. He says, At my first offense, no one stood with me, but all forsook me. But he says, May it not be charged against me. So he's talking about his first offense. He's talking about his first offense when he came back to Rome for his second imprisonment. It was basically his arraignment. You know how they arraign you up to make sure the charges are real? You know, or they're going to kick them out before you go forward? So they found the charges to be real on him. So this is the thing. So he was sitting there, he said, in my first offense, no one stood with me. That means all of you think about it. You're an apostle Paul. You're an apostle Paul. You didn't evangelize the whole way. You know, area, everywhere, three missionary trips, and you can't find a single soul to come and stand with you at your arraignment. Not a soul. Mm-hmm. That's got to hurt. Mm-hmm. This is where he was at. And I love how he says it. He says this, but you, you, hear the, you hear the forgiveness in his heart. He says, but, he says, but all forsook me. But he says this, may it not be charged against them. He's not holding it against them. Because see, anybody being found associated with Paul means that your neck is on the chopping block too. So you got to think about why Luke was there. Luke was not only just a physician, but he was a friend. Because anybody being associated with this young man, Paul, because Paul was considered to be great evil, being brought before Caesar, all these wonderful people in this experience. 17, he says, but who stood with him? Does that surprise you? No. No. Why? Because that's what he did. He's been standing with What was his promise? Never leave. Never leave. Never leave. He's nor forsake you. He didn't care how difficult he got. He didn't care how high the kitchen got. He didn't care how great the turf, the turf, all the, tra- the tragedy was, or the calamity in your life. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That is the promise that God has given to each and every one of us who believes in him. And so therefore, you find here, Paul simply says, this is what the Lord stood with me. But not only did he stand with him, what else did he do? He didn't know. <coughs> gave, him gave him strength. You know, I understand that. that we, I'll, 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 there's another piece I'm going to give you. I'm going to take you back to that real quick. Because he gave him strength. And this is, it, it is the end of his life. And he's still giving him strength. <coughs> Y'all let me buy this. Stay with me. Acts chapter 9, verse 22. Thank you. 
that he preaches in this experience, his name was Saul. That Saul is the same Paul. Right. And you want to realize this is the beginning of his ministry. And what did he do? He, he did something about his preaching and what? Strength. So at the beginning of his ministry, he says that the, his, he increased him in strength in the beginning. Right. And I want you to see that he, throughout his ministry, he had increased him. And also at the end of his life, he's still doing what? Do you understand what I'm trying to get you to see tonight? That God does not walk away from you, nor does He leave you weak in the situation that you find yourself in. From the beginning, from when He calls you into service, He strengthens you. While you're in service, He strengthens you. And at the end of service, He's doing what? Strengthens you. Isn't that beautiful? That's rich. That's rich. Alright. Let's move on with this. Uh, Go ahead. Down here where it says, um, uh, the very last part of that, I was delivered out of the lion's mouth. Did they see this Christian to this point to the lion? They did, but he's not referring to that. Okay, what's he referring to? He's referring to danger in general. Oh, mm-hmm. he's danger. Okay. Mm-hmm. What do you have that, Dr. Wayne? No, I was, I was just going to go back to uh, 16. Basically, what he was saying, what Paul was saying that, uh, in my first defense, no one stood with it. Mm-hmm. But all specifically, basically, they did what you know, the Lord said he wouldn't do. Exactly. So. See, that's what I'm saying. Man will fail us. Right. And see, we get too caught up in the fact that when people fail us because we put a lot of faith in people. Mm-hmm. But your faith should be in Christ. Right. And so, therefore, this is why I'm telling you, they did not, they, this is why he could sit there and say, don't hold it against the Lord because right. they're, they're of the flesh. They're right. in the flesh. Right. But he says the one. He says, but but the Lord mm-hmm. stood with me. Right. Or oh, he can boast now. Or oh, you, 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 mm-hmm. you see where his boasting is? His boasting is in the Lord. He says everybody else forsook me, but here he is in the the, the Lord. I'm going to boast in Him because not only did He stand with me, but also He strengthened me. But why do you need strength at the end of His life? Because the Lord said that they would do it. That men would forsake him. Yes, He did. And that He would. So. That's the reason why I said, don't charge it again. Because you said they could do it, they did it. So I'm not really surprised. That but every day we're surprised, Doc. Every day we're surprised. You know. Because we, we think we know people. We think we know people. There's a lady who talked to me today. You remember the, the, the kid that, that was being held captive over here by the in shape place? Mm-hmm. Okay. Her son, the, I work with this lady, her son owns a semi-pro football team, and that guy who was going to get life mm-hmm. played on the team. Mm-hmm. And their whole family, knew him well, right. are taken back by this thing to my house. And she goes, she asked me today, she simply asked me this question, she said, how could that be that he was that person? She said, because the person we knew was a gentle person, giving and kind and loving and so forth. And I said, see, because... The greatest of evil don't ever always show you his head. Mm-hmm. See, the ones that show you what they are, you instantly label them as such. But mm-hmm. the greatest of ones is not the ones that you can see. It's the ones you don't know and can't see. Yeah. And that's what's so hard about this because there's are some that he's been in our house, he didn't have dinner, he didn't see our kids, he didn't da 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 And then you find out that there's more to them than that, than what they just Right. You know, this is why, you know, I, I, I tell you, I said Sunday, it's not about the day that you said you gave your hand to the Lord and you shook the path of hand and so forth. Because that day is an event. Mm-hmm. The validation of your salvation is how you walked after that event. Right. That's how this is different. Because the family who's talked to me are Christians. And they've been talking to the Lord and everything with them, but you see, there are a lot of religious. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Y'all stay with yeah. But I was, go ahead. Um, I was just going to say real quick. Um, the same time the Lord says, okay, well, man will, you know, forsake it, but it has to hurt. It does. It's important. And the first thing you do is when the charges are brought up, you know, I'm not talking from personal strength, yeah. but you look back. Hey, you know, because I know somebody. You know, there on my behalf. Yeah. On my behalf. Yeah. And there's nobody. Nobody. <laughs> and I want you to realize that this was a big thing. 
So we're going to give you just a few moments to try to draw the grandeur of this experience. Okay? Almost all of Rome showed up for this experience for Paul's arraignment. Because he was the great evil. Remember, Rome had part of Rome had burned down, and the Christians were blamed for it, and Paul was being the leader of the experience. But did Cyrus burn it down? It was Nero who burned it down. Nero? Nero burned it down. Cyrus. That was in the Old Testament. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nero burned it down and blamed the Christians for it because Paul was considered to be the leader of the Christians. He was the great evil. That was the one that come marching in. So everybody wanted to see who this great evil was. And so therefore, he had a cosmopolitan of cosmopolitan fleet. When he walked into the, the courtroom. Okay? We're going to get to that. Y'all stay here. We're going to finish this with you. The Lord's will. He says this. But he said, also I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion who's talking about in general because it was he's talking about danger in general. Okay. okay. Most people want to take it back to like Daniel and the lion's den and so forth. Well, that's what I thought. Yes. But they did. They did. They did. Okay. 18 he says, and the Lord delivered me from what? Some Every evil. Every evil word. And he did what for me? He preserved me for what? For his other case. He said, so for the Lord has delivered me out of every evil work. Right? Mm-hmm. Go ahead. Well, well, what I was going to say is, in, this, in 17, he's speaking, he could be in the present, he's speaking what happened before. <coughs> he skips part and starts <coughs> the future. Mm-hmm. And he says, and the Lord shall deliver me. Yeah. So he's got the faith that God is going to deliver him out of everything that's going to happen to him. It's not. Yeah, it's already done. It's already done. See, yeah. this this is what this is what that, that, that beautiful thing about faith is that remember we say that our name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life? Okay? And that we've got a mention with our name written on. He said, I'll go to the paraphrase you, I'll come back and redeem it to myself. So that we know you've got some place to go, he's not just gonna put you out and never never lane. Mm-hmm. Alright? So therefore, he, he realizes that he's not saying that God is not, can't deliver him from his death. It's about to happen because he knows his death, his time has come. And therefore, even in his death, he is being delivered. That's the beauty of it. Even in his death, God is still delivering him because he's not going to a place of punishment. He's going where? He tells you right there. He's going to his heavenly kingdom. Right there. there. He's not waiting for the millennium Christ to come. He's going right there. He's going to leave about the eyes is going to close and open up. That's the beauty. Isn't that exciting? Oh, that's exciting. Y'all should watch it out. He says, And the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. And then now the king, king okay, I want you to I'm read it for you one time. I'm going to put some emphasis on it. And the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. And it says, And to him glory forever and ever. Amen. So he couldn't hold in and joy. you got to remember, he's writing this. He's in prison writing this. And as he's writing it, he gets a little of the spirit hits and high or something because he starts to glory in God in the experience. How many of us could glory in God in the fact knowing that any moment that they can come in and say, Okay, it's time. Lay your head down. Chop it off. But you see, he's glorying in God. He's glorifying God. Do you, you see it? Do mm-hmm. you see the scripture? I mean, he's standing here saying, he said, he, said, for, he said that the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. He says, then he goes, also now, and here he is, he's he, he elated. He, he's rejoicing. He's rejoicing. He's understanding he is suffering. And yet you find him rejoicing, saying that God is just coming in his life. In every situation he found himself in, whether he was being snake bit, whether he was being shipwrecked, whether he was in prison, whether he was being stoned, God delivered him from every last single one of them. He's got it. Because he's living, he, he gets to look back at his life. And he knows that statement is so true. And that even now, he knows the impending death is coming, but here comes the greater deliverance. Because he says, I'm going to graduate now. I'm going to get to the No, no, I, I, I just, it was kind of funny because here he is. He's going to be put to death and everything else. But it could happen at any moment, but he's, he, he, you go back a little bit, he says, yeah, but bring my clothes. Bring my clothes. <laughs> bring my clothes. <laughs> but you know what we're going to talk about? You know, because he said, there's some when it's coming. He's pretty right. comfortable in what he's talking about. I mean, yes, he is. Yeah. He knows that's the confidence that he has in his faith. That's what makes faith so beautiful. Because he has no confidence in the flesh. 
He put no confidence in the people around him. He knew the guards. Remember when he first was thrown in prison, where the guards would change him and he was preaching to them and all that wonderful stuff and they were being saved? He didn't put no confidence in them. And they were in Caesar's household. Where is his confidence in? Y'all tell me. In the Lord. If he's the Lord, that's what I'm like. This is. And he's writing this to Timothy. Because Timothy's going to need this. Because see, when the mentor graduates, the pupil becomes the teacher then. Do y'all see that? Wow. He says, to him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Oh, he just didn't see it. Oh, that's wild. That's wild. But then, now I want you to look at, as he closed the letter out, he knows this is the last time. His last words. His last experience. Last chance to serve. His last thought. So he goes back to those who have served faithfully with him. Do y'all remember Priscilla and Achilles? They worked with him in the ministry. He said, Greek with Presca and Achilla in the household of, what's that word? Onesphorus? Onesphorus. Okay, I'll find that. Yeah. So he says this, he tells them to greet them. This is what he's telling Timothy because they're in Ephesus. He's saying, greet them when you see them for me. Give them one last hug and kiss on the cheek for me. For me. Because they had served faithfully with him. If you look in, because uh, they were actually part of his second missionary journey. Yeah. So back in uh, Acts 18? Acts 18 and 1. Acts 18 and 1. That's where it's at. Acts 18. Acts is getting to work out tonight. I believe it's 18 and 1 where they, where they, they're on the first journey with him. <laughs> you know what I like about this? I heard Katie shut from right along with me. And it says, Acts 18 and 1 says, And after these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth, and he found a Jew named Aquila, born in Pontius who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had commanded that all Jews depart from Rome and he came to them and so became and so because he was of the same trade because they were trip tent makers as well like Paul he stayed with them and worked for by occupation they were tent makers verse 4 says and he reasoned in the synagogues every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks and it says in verse 5, When Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus Christ is Christ, that Jesus is the Christ. But verse 6 says, And when they opposed him and blasphemed, he shook his garments and said to them, Your blood be upon your own head. I am clean. From now on I will go to the Gentiles. So therefore they were there in the early stages with him. And it's his sin. So now, this is what I love about it, because he doesn't forget those who are faithful. He tells them to say hi to him for me. Greet them. Greet Priscilla and Aquila in the household of Onesimus. And then verse 20, he says, The rest of stayed in Corinth, but Trophimus I left in Militus. Now, this is what you need. The rest of what I write about him. <coughs> They think he was the uh, treasurer of Corinth. To Rome. Let me find Rome 16 and 23. Rome 16 and 23. Y'all about to get in the work at the night. 16 and 23 reads. It says, Gaius, my host and the host of the whole church, greets you. Erastus, the treasurer of the city, greets you. And Fortus, a brother, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. So, therefore, they think he was the same person. He's referring to the guy that was in the treasurer at uh, Corinth. Yes. And then... Trophimus was a native of Israel. They 
Asia, uh, especially Ephesus, who had also a company called from Greece to throw out. Oh, I know why I want to talk to you about him. Go back to Acts one more time. This guy here. Y'all remember when he was first uh, to be in prison in, uh, in Acts? This is Acts chapter 20, verse 4. He said, He had a job. He was a tin maker, but his main purpose was to preach and teach and show the word of God. So therefore, he made a living for himself with his hands by doing the trade which he was trained to do. But yet, he never forsook the first calling on his life, which was to preach and teach the word of God. And this is the thing is that many of us will say, well, you know, I'm going to do this until I'm about 50 years old, and then I'm going to go get God his time. You don't get to say that. But we do it. Oftentimes, we never make it to it. Because, see, God got work for you to do, and you can't put Him on hold. He don't do well with that. So, verse 21, He says this here to them. Do your utmost to do what? Why would that be important? I just two things. Well, it's cold in the winter. It's cold in the winter. Because see, what's the difference in this imprisonment from the first imprisonment? You already know. Huh? He said it's cold and damp. It's cold and damp because the first imprisonment he's going to rent the house mm-hmm. for two years. Dungeon. This is a dungeon dungeon. Mm-hmm. This is prison prison. This is a hole in the ground. This is a hole in the ground. Up there somewhere. Exactly. So therefore, he's in a bad, bad, bad way. And it's about to be cold, cold, cold. There's nothing but stone. Okay? We can't get more stuff. We can get more. What do you say? We can be surprised. We can get more. 
Yeah, he's there. He's there, that's what I'm saying. So, you know, he, he's yeah. asking for these things. He says, come. And also, it's going to be difficult for the disciples. But when, remember when he was trying to get back to Rome? Yeah. Yeah. When they were bringing him in prison the first time? The weather got bad and they had to be laid up someplace else to right. work. And that's how the work. ship ended up being shipwrecked. Because they tried to go on out during the winter time and the water was really bad and the ship crashed up and he told them the angel Lord spoke to me and said that none of you none of you gonna lose your life, but the ship got run aground. Because see it was all about winter. Winter is ugly during that time frame over there. And so therefore that one's you got those two things up there that's happening. One, it's gonna be cold, and two, it's gonna be hard to get there if you come after or in within while winter is going on. Okay. And he says do your utmost to come before winter. And then he says, Eubola greets you, as well as Putin, Linus, Claudia, and all the brethren. So now, these, these, they're saying these first three names are all Latin, so therefore they make their Italian sense. And, um, and Claudia was a believer and close friend of Paul, but nothing else was known of this person. He's saying they all breathe. They all call out to me. And then at the end, how does he close in 22? Lord, with a blessing. Not a complaint. Not I wish I would have. I wish I could have. Maybe I should have. <coughs> Close this is just, I wrote this down. I wanted to read this to you guys. Okay, so do you think the letter was intended to be read for the congregation? It was the last part of it. The last part of it was meant. I actually wrote that down too. Now, thank you for mentioning that. See, because the U is plural which meant mm-hmm. that it's, it, it's extended to the entire Ephesian congregation. So, I wrote down two trains of thought on that particular passage of Scripture. Because one thought was that it was meant for the entire congregation. And then the other thought was that the statement of grace, the, the Lord uh, be with your spirit and grace be with you, was mm-hmm. meant to those who were with him mm-hmm. there. Right. That part, mm-hmm. not the whole letter. Because mm-hmm. the whole letter was for Timothy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The final yeah. words of Timothy, his instructions mm-hmm. to him, and so forth. So the more uh, applicable interpretation would be that this last part of the writing mm-hmm. and so forth was for it. That's what we meant to share with them because the rest of that letter was really written directly to Timothy. So he kind of ended that letter to Timothy. Yeah. And he said, Amen. Amen. And then it started this part. So. And, it, and that's the thing. So, it, to me, when I, when I, when I see this, because this is what I this is what I wrote down. Here he lays down his pen. The letter is finished. His ministry is ended. But the fragrance of his life and testimony abides with us still, and we shall meet him again and talk with him about the grand themes of the gospel in the church. This was Paul. This is it. I mean, there was nothing else from Paul after this. The next, they don't say how much longer it was between this letter and the time of his death, but there was nothing else that went out for him that's capturing God's word. This is it. A victorious letter. One with joy. I mean, he, he was he couldn't hold it in. Uh, yeah, I know. Wait, I'm sorry. What is, how, how did he die? Was he? I don't remember. Because he he was a Roman citizen. <coughs> Roman citizens were not allowed to be crucified. Right. Or thrown to the lion. Yeah. Mm. And that unique. Look at how this guy finishes. I'll show you this with you. Preaching through Philippians, teaching through 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, you're just looking at Paul's life. 
I'm, I've been able to look at Paul's life from the beginning of his ministry, the middle of his ministry, and the end of his ministry. And there's one thing that I can definitely say about this young man is that he was consistent. Whether he was in the beginning of it, in the middle of it, or the end of it. Whether he was being persecuted, whether he was being stoned, whether he was in prison the first time, prison the second time. Never questioned. Never questioned it. And the more he suffered, the greater he rejoiced. Uh, and that's something. That's something. Also, I want you to know, I know some people were said that the young man was sick. He left one of the guys, uh, uh, Trophimus. I left him in Bilitus 6. Paul had the ability to heal. I know that, right? Oftentimes, when he can go back and look at the times where he used the healing power and things of that nature, he was in the presence of the Jews to validate his ministry as being real and that Christ was real. This is unique. This young man. To, to, to. This was the same guy who said the foot of Gamaliel and teacher of the law. He was a Pharisee. This is the same God who persecuted the church to the nth degree, killed people, held the cloaks of those while Stephen was being stoned. Same God. Same God. This is what I love about it. I share often that everybody's an ex something before you come to the knowing knowledge of who Christ Jesus is. Paul had a lot of credentials, religious credentials that he could have boasted on. Do you know that when he said that he was born on the eighth day, or circumcised on the eighth day, that was a religious credential? When he said that he was a, a, a Hebrew of Hebrew, that was another religious credential? When he said that he was of the tribe of Benjamin, that was a religious credential of being of high of a ranking because Benjamin and Judah were one of the highest ranking of the Israel of tribes of Israel? These are all religious credentials because these are the things that he was going to use and every other Jew was going to try to use to buy their salvation. But you can't. Did you know that? It's free. It's free. You're going to hear a little more about this come Sunday at the Lord's Will. Because this is the, the, the title of the sermon. I'm, I'm pretty sure I will use this one. Um, it's called... Um, Religious credits that don't impress God. Because he's going to deal with, because at the end of verse 3 of Philippians chapter 3, he says that the true Christian puts no confidence in the flesh. And then, verse 4, he starts giving you his credentials, his religious credentials of what he was prior to the road to the mass. Because see, what we don't realize that on that road to the masses, like each and every one of us, when we came to a known knowledge of Christ, okay, we had a chance to look at our life, flash back over all that we thought we were and could be, and surrender it all to Christ right there. We never thought about what Paul had to surrender to give to accept Christ. If you read verses 4 through 7, actually 4 through 8, you'll find out Find out. This is, this is what, and, and, and it happens just that quick mm-hmm. on the road to Damascus. This is what makes this person such a unique individual because he was just a human cat who says he was the chief of sinners. Not, but yet when you read the word of God, he said, I am the chief of sinners. He doesn't put a word on him, he doesn't put a past it on him. He speaks of it in the present, and this is what kept him so humble is the simple fact that he never lost sight of who he used to be or what he was without Christ. If we ever remove the fact or we get too comfortable with the idea of the fact that I am saved and sanctified and my sins is cast as far as the east is to the west, it's easy to get kind of upset. Yeah. To 
to call Neville off fire of his sin. He didn't let it control him, but he never forgot where he came from. Exactly. What do you think of this book? Was it good? Very good. Very good. Because the Lord's will, we'll be off next week, and then we're going to come right back and we're going to do Titus. So we're going to do the trifecta. We're going to hit all three of the, uh, these are called the pastoral epistles. First Timothy, Second Timothy, Timothy, and Titus. What? What's that? Because <laughs> nobody else? I'm in. You in? Because see, even I talked to Pastor Dennis, we had dinner with uh, Pastor Dennis and his bride on Friday, and uh, we were talking about this briefly. He said, even in seminary, they don't teach you a lot of this. Because I'll share with you that most preachers and pastors do not take their congregation through the pastoral epistles. They, they, they normally don't do it. You know, but I, I, I'm enjoying it. I hope you guys are enjoying it as well as we go through it because you get to understand what God is holding me accountable to and those who stand before you to preach or teach. But also there's a responsibility that comes in this for you guys as well. Because you can read it. You know, you go through it. You know, it's better to read it all on your own. Find somebody to teach it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>